be reading in First Peter. You don't you don't have to turn there. First, I'm going to do a little bit of context that we have history and we have an understanding of what's going on in our world. So I'm going to start with that. I have to take my glass off so I can read, and then Brother Mark will get you to turn there. So Simon Peter and his brother Andy. Peter was written in about 64 A.D. I like that God uses Peter. For any of you that have read through the Bible, you know that Peter was quite a bold, forward, leader type gentleman. He tended to rush into things and always not considering maybe others around him, but anxious to take part and to be involved in different things. But I'm glad that God uses people like Peter and Christians like us because we're Christians who struggle with doubts, fears, weaknesses, and sins from time to time. But God still uses us. For example, you probably remember when Peter saw Jesus walking across the water. And then he wanted to walk across the water, but Jesus said no. Peter started to walk across the water. And then all of a sudden he realized, what in the world am I doing? He got scared, was nervous, and of course he started to sink. So Christ had to reach out and save him. Then there was a time Peter was inquiring how many times he should go with him. So Peter, of course, being bold, thought, I know, I'm going to give him a really good answer. Seven. And, of course, Jesus said to him, no, 70 times seven. So, again, Peter was kindly instructed by Jesus, what was the right thing? And then, of course, you remember when Jesus and Peter were talking, and Peter told Jesus that he would never deny him, ever. He would die for him. He would pay the bill. And then we all know that the Greeks came, and they took Jesus away. and being questioned by Pilate. And then Peter was out in the surrounding area standing by fires of people. And then he was questioned by one of the Roman officials and he denied and denied again. And then he denied and swore that he knew nothing about those people. He was not part of those people. So Jesus was the right again. And I always wonder if any of us are in that situation where your life would be taken. Would you, would we allow Jesus to take us? I certainly pray I would and hope not. So 1 Peter was, he was writing to the saved Gentiles. And there were some some Greeks there as well, some Jews, who were dispersed or scattered among the uh, scattered among Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which are all part of modern day Turkey. And they had gotten dispersed like children because they're not really of the world, but they're in the world. So Peter was writing in a general sense. Paul frequently, who wrote a lot of his books in the New Testament, was writing for a specific province or his attention. There was something bad going on in the church and among the people. Peter was writing in general. Think about it. 
God the Father and Jesus the Son gave us the perfect living word of God so that we can learn the things that we need to know. So that we can learn how to live our lives rightly. If you think about it many times, we talked about this in Sunday school a few times. How do we know how to live right? Well, many of us, especially those of us who didn't grow up in Christian homes and got saved later in life, we're only taught by the world. And the world, of course, is teaching us to live for ourselves. So as I think about it, when you become a Christian, you don't know anything about living right. So how can you do that? Well, thankfully God gave us this book to do it. And hopefully we'll learn and be smart and we'll live our life amongst other Christians that we can look to and learn from them the kind of lives we should live. Live and the kind of people we should be. So I'm so thankful that God gave us his perfect living word so we can learn how to do better and live right. So now I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to be reading 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, verse 13 through chapter 2, verse 1. But unlike most of the time, I'm not going to ask you to look up in your Bible. Instead, what I'd like you for us to do is to quiet your heart and still your mind and close your eyes and listen while I read it. I want you to listen to the words I'm going to read. It's, it's Peter telling us things to do. He wants his word out to the nations. So if you would uh, close your eyes and listen now, I'll repeat it. Really pay attention to what we're being said in this verse. 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hopes fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passion of of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for, for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and abiding word of God, flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the field. 
the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Thank you, Lord. Can we take some time to pray? Oh, Lord in heaven, certainly. Help us to realize what a blessing it is that we can come to you in prayer. That you love us. That you want us to come to you. That you want us to turn to you. God, I pray that you'll help each one of us here today as Christians to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory unto you. I pray that while we're together this morning that we can encourage each other we can strengthen one another because all of us deal with the world on a daily basis. Now again, I just pray that our lives will show that we love you and you love us. May you be with the pastor as he brings his message. And again, give us hearts to hear. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. I believe children can be dismissed at this time for Children's Church. Don't run anybody over, Steve. <laughs> if you're not already in First Peter, I invite you to turn there in your copy of the scriptures this morning. I have the privilege today to pick up where Pastor Jason left off couple of weeks ago as we study through this epistle of First Peter. Thank you, Steve, for reading the scriptures today. I'm going to pray again, not because Steve's prayer was bad, <laughs> but just because I feel the need to do so. Father, oh, what, a, what a joy and what a privilege you give us. To be recipients of your grace. Lord, as we study your word this morning, would you awaken within hearts that maybe have not been, to, been awakened yet to your grace? Would you, would you do that work? As I have the privilege of declaring the gospel today. And Father, for those of us whose hearts have been awakened, God, we thank you. We thank you that grace has not only awakened our hearts, but it continues to operate, it continues to stir us, to function within us. And so, God, we pray that that activity would continue today with great power for your great glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever gotten a taste of something so good that you got to have more, right? Think of something. So, so I was thinking about this question as I was going over this text this week and uh, studying through it. Have, have you ever gotten a taste of something so good that you just had to have more of it? And, and my, first, my first thoughts, my initial thoughts went towards food, right? Is that some good Baptist? Um, so, so I went towards food, but then I was driving down the road, uh, 223, going into Adrian, and man... This week was an amazingly beautiful week. Wouldn't you agree? Whew, how could you disagree with that, right? So, so as I'm driving, I'm, I'm just kind of, my mind is stirring on this question. Have, what have I tasted that's so good that I want more of it? And man, I'm, I'm like, I've got the, the front panels off our Jeep. My hair is flapping in the wind. <laughs> right, I'm going... I want more of this. I want more of this, right? 
So, so this week, we have had a taste of summer in mid-April, and man, did it deepen my longings for the reality of summer. I bet it did the same for you. Uh, my dad used to say that there are few things in life that can beat a Michigan summer, and I agree with him. But I, but I will say this, that, that there is absolutely nothing, there is absolutely nothing that can beat the glories of heaven. Do you know that as we live as believers, if you're here this morning, you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've turned to him from your sin, you've trusted him as your savior, if you believe in the Lord, you this morning live in the springtime. Now, now I, just, I just started thinking about this, ruminating on this from, from a seasonal perspective, right? As believers, we live in the springtime. Grace has entered in. The grace of the gospel has entered in, has saturated your heart, has brought to life something inside of you that makes you want more, right? I want more grace. Who doesn't need more grace? Keep your hands down. (laughs) Grace has activated life inside of us. The death of winter, right? Everything in the winter around us is dead. It's dried up. There's no life. The death of winter, what we know spiritually then as the sin of the old us. The old me was full of death before I met Christ. BG, before grace. Before grace, I was dried up and withered on the inside and so were you. If you're here without Christ this morning, you are dried up and you are withered on the inside and you need grace to stir your bones, to bring your soul to life. The death of winter, the old us, the old me, is being done away with inside of us and and we have tasted, we have just gotten an inkling of a taste of what is to come through the grace of God in our salvation. So friends, this morning, we do not yet fully taste the summers of heaven, but we are getting a taste of them just like we got a taste of summer this past week. Now, now tonight, I, I, saw, I looked at the weather forecast today, and, and so as the day progresses, it's going to get colder, and there's a chance of snow tonight. So I hope you enjoyed it. It was just a taste. But I hope it stirred hope in your hearts that summer is right around the corner. And then there is a grace working in you this morning, I trust, and, and that if it's not already working in you, I trust that by the end of our time, it will have, have begun its work in you, and grace is working. Grace is working. Both the death of the old man, the, de- the death of the old you, the death of the old me, grace is doing that work in the believer, and the life of the glories of the new man are br- being brought to a reality by grace. So that you were saved by grace and that you are being saved by grace and so that when you are fully saved, when you fully realize your redemption, the finality of it, it will have been done by grace. Grace, grace, grace from beginning to the end. We long for the appearing of our Savior, and as we long for the appearing of our Savior, we, we long to fully embrace the summer, the summer of heaven, the summer of eternity, when sin is passed away, when these bodies that are failing us, we, we will take on our glorified bodies fit for eternity. They will no longer decay. They will no longer get sick. And so as we study through this first chapter of First Peter, we see the depths and the riches of God's grace to us. I see them as the beginnings of the tastes of grace. God graciously initiates the, the new spiritual birth that he generated in our hearts. Look at, look at 1 Peter 1, verse 3 again. We'll, we'll go back and just recap for a minute here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
God graciously provides for us an inheritance, verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And that God is graciously guarding us and our faith in these dark and turbulent days, assuring us that he graciously keeps us till the day when we will receive the fullness of our salvation, verse 5. Right, who by God's power, not by my good works, not by your good works, not by my power or your power, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, now if you've tasted that the Lord is good, that's, that's chapter 2, verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, that, that means don't take that for granted this morning. We could begin right there and, and just, just kind of ask that question and, and see, okay, Holy Spirit, have I tasted, Lord, have I tasted that you are good? Have I tasted the goodness of God in the land of the living? So if you've tasted the, that the Lord is good and gracious, that is, you've trusted him for salvation, then this is describing the new you. These early tastes of God's grace towards us. And, and, and grace, of course, is, is God's unmerited favor. You and I don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. If we earn it, then it's not grace. It's works. If we work for it, if we could, if we could do enough good to deserve it, then, then we become our own Savior. We become the idol of our hearts. But these tastes of God's grace that every believer has gotten are now at work in our hearts producing desires in us for a different way of living, for a different purpose, and a deep longing for the appearing of Jesus. Don't you long to see the appearing of Christ? You've been born again. If you know the Lord, you've been born again into a new family with a new father, a heavenly father. You've been born again into a family with a new brother. Your brother is Jesus the Christ firstborn of creation, the firstborn of the resurrection. You've been born into this new family. You have a new father and a new brother. You have a new spirit, a new spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives within you. He is the down payment, the scriptures tell us, on our salvation, the assurance that we have that God will deliver us to the very end, to the other side. See, these tastes of grace produce within us a sober mind that deeply longs for more grace that is promised to us at the revelation of Jesus. That's verse 13 in our text in chapter 1. This grace has produced within us a reverent awe of the God of wonders who has so graciously rescued us and redeemed us. Verses 17 and 18. Fear the Lord. That grace has also produced within us not only a desire uh, to, to be with Jesus one day, but the desire to be more like Jesus right now. In all your conduct, be holy as he is holy, right? Verses 14 through 16. So, so even in these beginning tastes of God's grace at work in us, they have produced, grace has produced within us a family DNA, that thickens our ties to one another and enriches our relationships with brothers and sisters who share in the same grace, producing the same desires. So this morning, the more, the more grace that we taste here, the deeper our longings grow for more grace to come. Right? So, so grace, uh, I, I'm thinking of Romans 1, I think it's verse uh, 16 and 17. More grace leads to more grace. More faith, your faith leads to more faith. It's grace upon grace. So as we get a taste of grace, we, we grow, we deepen in our longings for more of this grace that has awakened within us life. We want life. We want it more abundantly because that's what Jesus has promised for us. So, so what is the grace of God working in us? I, I've mentioned a few here as we've reviewed chapter 1, but in our text today, verses 22 down through chapter 2, verse 3, 
What is the grace of God working in us in order to bring about these family traits of hope and holiness? I just want us to identify two, two life-giving qualities that I picked up on in our text today. Number one, the taste of grace has brought to life within us expressions of genuine love. Let's look at verses 22 through 25 again. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flower falls. But... The word of the Lord remains forever. This, this taste of grace, this initial salvation that, that God has entered in and, and where there was once death, where there was once winter in our souls and spring has, has sprung up to life. Grace has caused the, the new blooms of life to, to uh, be enriched in our souls and, and we begin to long for the fullness of summer, the fullness of the glories of heaven. These expressions of genuine love have been awakened in the believer's heart. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I had no desire to go to church, to be around God's people. I had no desire to do that. But man, when, when I tasted the grace of God, something came alive in me and said, man, I've got to go. I've got to be around God's people. I need it. I long for it. I want to be there. The same love that has been so richly and deeply expressed to us by our new heavenly Father, has now brought life to us in relationship to, to each other. This is the command of the text. There's, there's two commands in this text. The one command in the text I just read, the verses I just read. The command is keep on genuinely loving one another. Keep on. The word earnestly means without ceasing. So it, so it literally reads, keep on loving one another. Keep doing that. Keep going in that direction. The fact that it's commanded tells us that it's not easy. Right, right? To, for us to love each other, there are obstacles and hindrances relationally at times that, that happen in the lives of brothers and sisters born into a new family with new DNA, spiritual DNA, spiritual life and vibrancy. Sometimes we have a hard time getting along together. See, see this, is not, this is not done in the natural man. No, this is done in the spiritual man. So, so it's not based on feelings. You and I won't always feel loving towards each other. But we are commanded, keep on, continue to love one another. So, so it's not rooted, this, this command to love is not rooted in our emotions, it's not rooted in our feelings. Then, then what is it rooted in? Well, first of all, it's rooted in our faith. We have a common faith together, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another. So, so this love flows from souls that have been purified. And how has, how has our soul been purified? Verse 22 says, by your obedience to the truth. So then the question comes, you're a good Bible student, you want to ask your Bible questions, and so the, the next question, logical question is, what does Peter mean by our obedience to the truth? Is he talking about grind it out, legalistic, obey the Ten Commandments, or obey the over 600 rules that the Pharisees came up with? Is that the kind of obedience, obedience to the laws? That's not what Peter is talking about. I think we can be certain of that. So, so having purified your souls by your obedience. So, so was I saved by works or was I saved by faith? Well, well, I believe in the context of what Peter is saying, the obedience, our obedience to the truth is our faith to the gospel. It's our faith in Christ. 
Uh, your faith in Christ, pre presuming you've put your faith in Christ, your faith in Christ is, is your obedience to the gospel. That is, the object of your faith has saved you. He has entered in and brought life to you. His name is Jesus Christ. He was crucified, dead, and buried. Now he's risen from the dead. He's ascended into glory forever. He has saved your soul, presuming that you have put your faith in him. That is your obedience to the truth. Jesus fulfilled all of our obedience. Jesus did what we could not do. Jesus did what I couldn't do, and that is to obey the whole law and the commandments. So this love is rooted in this faith in Christ. This love for one another springs up from the depths of our hearts, a transformed heart, a regenerated heart. This love springs up from the depths of our hearts. And when the Spirit of God is working in us and we're walking in the Spirit, we love each other. But, uh, man, when that flesh gets in, right? Your flesh ever get in the way? Mine does, right? When that flesh gets in and it, and it gets in the way, man, this thing can go sideways real quick. Real quick. We humble ourselves, submit to one another, Ephesians says. We, we obey the gospel by believing the gospel. Grace has worked within us to, to stir this new desire of love for the brethren, for brothers and sisters in Christ, in the family of God. 1 Timothy 1, 15, 1, excuse me, 1, 5 says this, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It's always, it's always nice when Paul and Peter agree together, right? Paul, who wrote to Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart. Uh, Peter says, having purified your souls, your heart, by your obedience to the truth. Right? This love has been generated supernaturally within us. Is that true of you? Is that true of you this morning? Do you see that sign of life, a, a, a new sign of a, a, of a new love for brothers and sisters in Christ, men and women, boys and girls who are of the same faith as you? So root number two is this. This genuine love is rooted in the imperishable seed by which we've been born again. Look again at verses 23 and 4. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed. Notice the word since. This is all one sentence, verse 22, 23. And into 24, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of the grass, the grass withers, the flower falls or fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. This love is rooted and grounded in the imperishable seed by which you have been born again, that is the word of God. So Peter is contrasting, comparing the natural man to the spiritual man. He, he draws this out in the quote from Isaiah 40, verses 6 and 8. All flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls. What's he saying there? What, what is God saying there? Well, well, the flesh is fading away. The flesh is fading away. It's like grass and it's like flowers. See, summer's going to come. But then summer's going to fade away. We don't want to talk about that, right? <laughs> the word of the Lord remains forever. So, so our natural birth happened through the seed of our human father. It is an inferior seed compared to the seed of our spiritual birth. Because the spiritual seed is imperishable, Peter says. Our first birth promises only the temporal nature of life and ultimately leads us to death because the seed is rooted in the sinful nature of man and therefore produces sin and death. That's the natural seed. The spiritual seed, which is the word of God, has been planted at some point, at some moment in your life, believer. The spiritual seed of the word of God was implanted in your soul and up from the grave it arose. And it brought life. 
Because up from the grave, he arose. And so this superior seed, the spiritual seed, comes through the living and abiding word of God. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. The spiritual seed is superior not only because it is imperishable, but also because it is enduring. The seed to which Peter is referring is the word of God, and I believe it is the word in conjunction with the Holy Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, and the Word is planted in your heart and in my heart, and it begins to ferment and to ruminate, and it begins to grow. And it begins to bring to life, once we've received the implanted Word, this is what James says, receive the implanted Word with meekness that is able to save your soul. Man, when that happens, things start to happen. In the soul that never happened before. Life begins to spring up from the ground. Loving one another means choosing to show deep affection and care for each other. This command to love each other genuinely and without ceasing is not based, as I said, on our feelings about each other. It's a love that is a fruit produced from the taste of God's gracious rescuing work that has taken place in the believer's heart. Love is a choice that requires that we bring our feelings and our emotions in line with who we know and with what we know. So so this is the church's predominant witness to the world, how we love one another. How we love one another. Friends, when we're not loving one another, our witness is tainted. Our witness is diminished in the eyes of the world. When we don't wrestle against our fleshly weakness and against our adversary who seeks to divide us and we allow strife and division to persist in our ranks, then we hinder that witness to the world. So so this is the grounds of our spiritual battle. You wonder, why why do I put on the armor of God? Oftentimes, I'm, I'm guilty of thinking, man, the battle is out there. The battle's out there in the highways and the hedges of our community and our, and our world and our national politics. No, 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 no. Th- there is a battle out there. But the biggest battle I face is right in here. It's here and it's here. That's the biggest battle that I face. Jeff, put on the whole armor of God and fight against the inherent weakness that I still carry around in my body. Grace is putting it to death, but it's not dead yet. It's been crucified with Christ positionally, but man, experientially, I'm still carrying around that old man and the remnants of that old man. Man, I want to be rid of it. And this is part of that, that longing that, that lives within you and I for the glories of the summers of heaven to be, to be removed from the presence of sin. To have sin, sin in me, not just sin around me, but have sin in me and sin in you vanquished once and for all, crucified, dead and buried, gone forever. That love that we're we're called now, commanded to extend to each other. These desires have been born in us as a product of grace. Well, the second quality here is verse 25, then through chapter 2 and verse 3. Grace has brought to life within us deep longings for the word of God. You see how this works? Because... I, I, I thought about starting with this point and going to the next one because really this point fuels love, right? The Word of God, you and I in the Word of God, faithfully studying the Word of God, becoming students of the Word, allowing the Word to be received and to make a home within our hearts, that is what continues to generate and to feed and to fuel this, this grace for love for love for one another that's been awakened within us. It's the word of God. Let's read these verses again. And this is the word of God. Excuse me, this is the good news that 
was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So grace has generated within us longings, a hunger, a desire for the word of God. The command here, so, so we have two commands, uh, love one another, keep on loving one another. And here in this, these verses, it's long for the pure spiritual milk. Long for the spiritual milk of the word of God. If we are to grow in the graces of our salvation, then we must feed our longings for spiritual milk of the word of God. Grace produces this longing. You're not called to generate the longing yourself. If the longing isn't in you, step back and ask God to evaluate, Lord, do I really know you? Because I don't have a hunger for your word. Nor do I have a longing to love my brothers and sisters or the people of God. So, so if these longings are not already generated within you, then, then listen, have you, have you tasted the grace of God? That's where you need to begin if these longings are not there. So, so what I want you to know today is the same grace that saves us also sanctifies us. We're not saved by grace and then carried through life by our works. No, we're, we're saved by grace and we keep going by grace. And grace fuels more grace. Aren't you thankful for that? And God is a... Is a lavish grace giver. He loves to give more grace. So a couple questions to close with. How do we nurture this longing for the word of God so that the longing deepens? So the, so the desire is there. How do we nurture it? Well, Peter says like newborn infants. Right? That's what the text says, verse 2. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Right? We live with a dependence on the word of God like a newborn infant lives with a dependence on milk. Now, I want you to remember back to when you were an infant. You can't do that. You can imagine the time, but you, I mean, I've never met anybody that can remember themselves as an infant. But we've seen infants, and, and we know that infants desire milk. So, so like newborn infants, we are to desire the sincere, the pure milk of the Word of God. We, we feast as babies. We feast on that food that we know will make us healthy and nurture our growth. Our growth. And, and as spiritual people, we, we feast, we feed on that which we know will Bring about spiritual growth and nourishment. Friends, the word of God has the required spiritual nutrients to help us grow and become strong and feed the new desires that have come alive within us because of our obedience of faith to the gospel. Sometimes our desire for the word, just like our, our desires, our, our fleshly weakness can enter in and, and cause us to, to be hindered in our love for one another. Well, well, by the same token, sometimes our desires can weaken for the word of God. And what do we do then? What do we do? And maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, ah, Jeff, I, my desires for the word of God are weak. I don't really desire to get in the word of God every day. What can I do? Well, generally, when our desires for God's word grow weak, we, we might be experiencing deepening desires for the old diet. Maybe we need a, we need a dietary change, right? That, that is, we need to starve the old man and begin to feed the new man. Starve out the old man, starve out the old Jeff, all the weaknesses, all, all the places that my mind runs to, that your mind runs to. Starve out the old man and begin to feed on the word of God. Again, it's not about feeling. Well, I don't feel like getting in the word. Well, it's a choice that we make. And sometimes it has to start with the choice. We begin to feed. Begin to, be, begin to feed that desire. If we obey the command to long for the spiritual milk of the word of God, then we must be putting away 
You notice I skipped over verse 1, right? Must be putting away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. That looks like a command too. I think it's a part of, the the imperative in the text is chapter uh, 2, verse 2. That's the imperative, long for the pure spiritual milk. I I think the verb there in verse 1 is linked to the command. Because, Because you can't, you and I can't hunger for the pure spiritual milk of the word if we're involved in maliciousness and deceitfulness and hypocrisy and envying and slandering. So, so just like in our diet, we know that there are some things that we put in our bodies, we can eat some things or we can do some things, we can pick up some bad habits that will stunt our growth and cause us to be hindered in our physical growth. Well, the, the same is true spiritually, right? In verse 1, Peter's sim- simply saying, look, here are some things that are going to stunt your spiritual growth. Put them off, cut them out. Maliciousness, deceitfulness, hypocrisy, that is pretending to be something you're not. Envying others and slandering others. They they put off these old things and begin to feed on the word of God. Starve the flesh and feed the spirit. Question number two is why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we nurture this longing for the word of God? Well, very simply put, Peter says that you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have been saved, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, that you might grow in the Lord. Grow in the Lord. Desire to grow. See, true believers will desire to grow. If you're a true believer, you want to grow in the Lord. You want to grow in your relationship with him. You want to honor him. Those desires have been brought to life by the grace of God that has worked in your soul to save you. Now feed them. Feed those desires and starve out the old desires. See, genuine believers don't have to be taught these cravings of loving community and growth in the word of God. They, they long for it. We long for it supernatural because It's been born within us. It is part of being born again. Grace saves and grace works to produce in us the character of Christ. So here, as we close, consider this. Have you tasted the grace of God? Have you tasted the grace of God? Are the signs of spring budding and blooming in your soul? Is there a hope in you for the appearance of Jesus Christ? I mean, truly. Do you desire that the Lord Jesus would appear? Do you have a desire in your heart that's living to love other brothers and sisters of like faith? Is there a desire in your heart for the purity of the milk of the word of God. See, if your soul is barren and dry when it comes to the foretaste of grace, if there are no longings for the word of God, if there has not been an awakening of love in your hearts, if the hope of the glorious appearing of Jesus has not sprung up in your heart as of yet, then I, I just invite you this morning. We're gonna have a we're gonna close with a song. I invite you to come and maybe you want to do business with God here at here at the altar in front and just Lay down your heart, surrender, and say, God, I just, I just need grace. I've been trying to do it myself, but I just need grace to do the work that I can't do. And just simply cry out in faith, believing on Christ and his finished work. I invite you during the invitation song to do that. If you want to talk to somebody, I mean, there, there are people here who, who would love to go aside with you and, and just talk you through that. If you have questions about it, don't be afraid. We're all friends here. And we gather because we, we care about each other's spiritual well-being. And we care about your spiritual well-being. So please don't think, oh, people are going to judge me. Whatever. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to judge you for coming forward. If we're truly saved, we're going to rejoice with you. (laughs) So don't be afraid. Don't let fear hinder you. Maybe today, 
Maybe today the, the weakness of your flesh has kind of just like taken over and, and you've fallen away. You know, old school preachers call it backslidden. Have you backslidden? You've slidden back into some of the old ways of life, the old cravings of your heart. You can come here and just pray and, and lay those down to the Lord and surrender them and ask for him, his fresh forgiveness over you. That God would just renew your heart and regenerate and renew your heart today. You don't have to get saved all over again. But just ask God to, to bring to life that which he's already brought to life at some point in the past and now has grown dull. I'm going to post, we're going to say, I'm going to invite the praise team. You guys go ahead and come as I close in prayer. But and by the time you get home this afternoon, if you go to our website, lesterhome.com, and you go over to the resource tab and you click on the blog, there's a link with some application questions to today's message. It's kind of a summary of the message, but then at the bottom of that summary, there's a link there with some application questions for you to consider. Maybe you do those in your devotions. Maybe you just sit and consider them and apply the word of God to your life. Just some practical things that you can think through. Father, We thank you for the life-giving word of truth. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. This grace that is abounding to us sinners. And even when we were sinners, when we were enemies of yours, you demonstrated, God, your love for us and that Jesus Christ died for us. Father, I pray this morning that you would awaken in the hearts of those in this room who are not truly saved. God, they would just be real and honest with themselves. God, even if they've been coming to church for years, pretending, maybe they're, maybe they just have, they're just not there. there there's been no awakening. There's no new desires. Their, their soul is dormant like winter. Oh, God, I pray that, that you will give them courage today. I pray you give them courage to step out and do business with you, surrender their hearts, receive the salvation that Christ offers them. And then, Father, for, for us who have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord, God, we pray that you will help us. May your spirit work within our hearts to, to just reveal, bring to light areas of our hearts that need to be surrendered. That in itself is a grace, God. And so we pray for that grace. Help us, Lord, to be obedient in this invitation. And may Jesus get the glory. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing.
blessing this morning. I just have a few announcements. You guys can be seated if you want. That's fine. It'll be at least an hour. Um, um, a big thank you to our, our cleanup work crew yesterday. That was awesome. I thought the church run was looking fantastic. I uh, appreciate all the help there. And then I want to mention uh, our baptism service coming up on May 7th. If you have not been baptized and you'd like to be baptized, you're feeling the Lord's leading in being baptized, and we would love to talk to you about that and baptize you. So if you're interested in that, you can see myself or Pastor Jeff. Um, there is a member meeting tonight, a family meeting tonight, where you can celebrate, look at, and celebrate what, what God has done and his faithfulness to our church. Um, I would encourage you, if you are a member, strongly encourage you um, to be active in that. It's, it's part of your responsibility in church membership to be active in coming to our member meetings. Um, and then as Pastor Jeff was talking about how summer, it, it felt like summer over the, over the last week, it got me going, uh, we better start planning some summer ministry. So I put together the, the dates coming up. God, if you can hit that one. Um, the dates coming up, kind of a mark your calendar, summer events, save the dates. Boys camp is June 23rd through the 25th. VBS is June 11th through the 14th. B -ball basketball camp is July 19th through the 22nd. And then our family camp is scheduled for August 11th through the 13th. So if you want to write those down now, I will try and get them out in an email this week so you can start planning your summer if you want to participate in those events and then let me just close first um, if you're visiting with us we're really glad to have you this morning you can see our our welcome desk um, on your way out stop by get information our church will give a small gift to you there and then also if you came prepared to give to worship in the act of giving there are black boxes outside um, these doors you can give online there is a qr code that you can scan right there it is Probably from your seat, you can scan that. That'll take you to our giving. And also there's a QR co code on your bulletin that will take you to our church's website. That's all I have. Let me just close. Throw things on the ground. Let me just close by reading um, from 1 Peter this morning. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding 